If we discovered tomorrow that there was an asteroid on collision course with Earth, we were able to calculate that it was going to hit Earth on the 3rd of June, 2080. And we knew that its impact was going to wipe out 70% of all life on Earth. Governments worldwide would marshal the entire planet into unprecedented action. We are now in almost precisely that situation. Except that there isn't a date, and there isn't an asteroid. The problem is us. The single most important project in my lab is to understand the future of life on Earth. We already know enough to know that we're in trouble. I think it's important that someone from in the science community come out and say so. 
we really are just interested in trying to figure out what are the impacts of, of humans on the planet and can we make valuable predictions about what's going to happen a day from now, a year from now, but probably more importantly, 10, 20, 30 years from now. What does, what does that predicted future mean for the fate of the human species? There is an enormous problem looming, but it, the problems for the vast majority of people now are still too far off to make you feel compelled to do something about it tomorrow, and that is the real problem. It's, it's kind of such an obvious thing that people don't think about it. Um, that, you know, all the things that we throw away, all the things that we buy and replace and, re, you know, that there's another seven billion people doing this. And that's what you don't think about. So I think it's more ignorance is bliss. We're just not heading in the right direction at the moment. All the problems are heading in the wrong direction. And we're showing almost no sign of actually tackling these problems. There are a lot of people that feel that way, but a lot of them won't say it publicly. Stephen is in many ways braver in terms of being willing to express perhaps pessimistic views very honestly in a very clear way. I've simply done my best to paint as accurate a picture as possible of what's actually happening. But I'm shocked at the number of people who just do not want to hear the, the truth. The film acts as a catalyst for a much broader debate. Brilliant. If not, I failed. Earth is home to millions of species, yet just one dominates it, us. Our cleverness, our inventiveness and our activities have modified almost every part of our planet. In fact, we're having a profound impact on it. Indeed, our cleverness, our inventiveness, and our activities are now the drivers of every global problem we face. And every one of these problems is increasing as we continue to grow towards 10 billion. I do just want to point out that I'm a scientist, not an actor, as is about to become um, all too painfully obvious. <laughs> I'm here because I believe that we can rightly call the situation we're in an emergency, an unprecedented planetary emergency. And this is what I'm going to talk about. We humans emerged as a species about 200,000 years ago. And in geological time, that's really incredibly recent. Just over 10,000 years ago, there were one million of us. Just over 200 years ago, there were one billion of us. 50 years ago, there were three billion of us. There are now over seven billion of us. By 2050, your children or your children's children will be living on a planet with at least nine billion other people. And sometime later this century, there will be 10 billion of us. 
possibly more. We've got to where we are now through a number of landmark events that have fundamentally shaped the state of our planet. Their legacy will continue to shape our future. So it's worth looking at our growth through the lens of these developments. One of the principal reasons we were able to grow was the invention of agriculture over 10,000 years ago. What has become known as the agricultural revolution started with the domestication of animals and the cultivation of plants for crops and has developed into today's intensive industrialization of the entire food production system. It enabled us to go from hunter-gatherers to highly organized producers of food and allowed our population to grow. This was also the start of a fundamental transformation of land use by humans. It's 1930. There are now two billion of us. And the impact of another revolution, the Industrial Revolution, was being felt. The world was being transformed by manufacturing, technological innovation, new industrial processes, and transport. But there's another story here too. The start of our lethal addiction to oil, coal, and gas as our principal source of energy. Thirty years later, we've grown to three billion. It's 1960, and then we're in the middle of the Green Revolution. There were more of us, far more of us, and we needed more food, far more food. And the Green Revolution provided this extra food. And it did so through the use of chemical herbicides, chemical pesticides, and chemical fertilizers. And an unprecedented expansion of land use for agriculture. But it was a revolution that came at a cost in terms of loss of habitat, pollution, and overfishing. And it set in motion the start of the degradation of entire ecosystems. By 1980, 20 years later, there were four billion of us. Green Revolution had produced more food, much more food, and that made food cheaper. And this meant we had more money to spend. By the 1980s, we'd well and truly started to spend all that money on stuff. Televisions, video recorders, Walkmans, hair dryers, cars, and clothes, as well as holidays. And at the center of this astonishing spending spree was an equally astonishing growth of transport. In 1960, there were 100 million cars on the world's roads. By 1980, there were 300 million. In 1960, we flew 100 billion passenger kilometers. But by 1980, we flew 1,000 billion passenger kilometers. And global shipping grew at a similarly astonishing rate. All of the stuff we were buying, plus all of the food we were consuming, plus all of the raw resources and materials required to make everything were increasingly being shipped all around the world. Just 10 years later, in 1990, we'd grown to five billion. 
By this point, the consequences of our growth were starting to show. Not least of these was on water. Our demand for water, not just the water we drank, but the water we needed for food production and to make all of the stuff we were consuming, was starting to go through the roof. And something was starting to happen to water. We saw journalists reporting from Ethiopia in 1984 about a famine of so-called biblical proportions caused by widespread drought. Ethiopia is turning into the worst human disaster for a decade, a disaster begun by nature but compounded by man. That, it seemed, was over there in Africa. Except that it wasn't just over there. Unusual droughts, as well as unusual flooding, were increasing in Asia, Australia, the US, and in Europe. Water, a vital resource we thought of as abundant and free, was now something that had the potential to be scarce. By 2000, we'd grown to six billion. And by this point, it had become abundantly clear to just about everyone in the scientific community that the climate was changing and that we had a serious problem on our hands. Now, obviously, climate's not the same as weather, but climate is one of Earth's fundamental life support systems, one that determines whether or not we're able to live on this planet. It's generated by four components. The atmosphere, the air that we breathe, the hydrosphere, the planet's water, the cryosphere, ice sheets and glaciers, and the biosphere, the planets, plants, and animals. And by now, our activities had started to modify every single one of these components. Our increasing CO2 emissions had started to modify our atmosphere. And our increasing water use had started to modify our hydrosphere. Rising atmospheric and sea temperatures had started to modify the cryosphere most notably an unexpected loss of Greenland and Arctic ice. And our increasing use of land for agriculture, cities, roads, mining, as well as all the pollution we were creating, had started to modify our biosphere. To put it another way, we had started to change our climate. There are now over seven billion of us. And as we continue to grow, we continue to increase our need or more water, more food, more land, and more energy. As a result, our activities are now fundamentally interacting with and altering the complex system we live on, Earth. We're spending eight billion euros at CERN to discover evidence of a particle called the Higgs boson to explain mass and provide a thumbs up for what's called the standard model of particle physics. And CERN's physicists are keen to tell us that it's the biggest, most important experiment on Earth. It isn't. 
The biggest, most important experiment on Earth is the one we're all conducting right now on Earth itself. I just want to take us on a tour of what's happening right now. Because it turns out that doing so is important to understanding where we're heading. Right now, nearly 40% of all the ice-free land on Earth is being used for food production. That leaves deserts, towns and cities, land use for mining and extraction of Earth's finite resources, protected areas such as national parks, and the world's remaining forests. And let's put that into context. Demand for food is set to double by 2050, increasing demand for more land. So no wonder that there's a remarkable land grab underway right now. In the past 13 years, there have been thousands of land deals involving governments and corporations, buying up lots of land in places such as Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and South America. Around 50 million hectares of land have been traded. That's an area approaching half the size of Western Europe, bought and sold in just the past 13 years. But that's not the most important story. Land use, land degradation, loss of habitat, and pollution runoff are now causing significant species loss. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, the world's leading authority on biodiversity estimates almost 31% of all amphibians, 21% of all mammals, and 13% of all birds are threatened with extinction. We're now almost certainly starting to lose species at a rate at least a thousand times greater than we would expect from ordinary background natural processes. Indeed, we may well have embarked on the greatest mass extinction of life on Earth since the event that wiped out dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Now, when we think about loss of species, some of us thinks about images of polar bears on thin bits of ice looking as though this is it. 
But losing polar bears is just the tip of the iceberg. No pun quite intended. <laughs> what we need to be a lot more concerned about is the loss of biodiversity itself. Because it turns out that biological diversity is not just a nice thing to have. It's the very diversity of life on Earth itself, the diversity that we are eroding, which provides the things that we rely on for free, like our water, our food, and our climate. The loss of biodiversity on a current scale is inevitably going to mean degradation of these vital ecosystem services, as they're called. Services that we all depend upon. The loss of these ecosystem services poses a very real threat to our survival. You might not be surprised to learn that food demand is increasing. What might be surprising is that food demand is increasing faster than even population growth. Why? First, is as more of us get richer or are lifted out of poverty, we consume more calories. We simply eat more food. The second is that more of us are not only consuming more, we're consuming differently. And in particular, we're consuming more meat. More importantly, though, the entire global food production system is dependent on a stable climate. And right now, the climate is anything but stable and is set to become more and more unstable every decade this century. about this. Food production accounts for nearly 30% of all greenhouse gases produced by human activity. That's more than manufacturing or transport. Producing more food itself is going to accelerate climate change. What's certainly true is that we really do need a food revolution, because without one, billions of us are going to starve. Our most recent food revolution started in the 1950s. It's known as the Green Revolution. But it has come at a cost. The first Green Revolution focused on increasing crop yield. But to increase yield, we had to introduce chemical fertilizers and breed shorter crops. In breeding shorter crops, we then had to compensate by deploying chemical herbicides to kill the weeds that would otherwise have outcompeted the crops for light. We also bred out crops' natural defenses to pests because plants' natural defenses to pests slow their rate of growth. But we then had to compensate for this by introducing chemical pesticides. And we became reliant upon an agricultural system that was ludicrously profligate with water. The Green Revolution turns out not to be a story about clever people who worked out how to get more food from our fields. The truth is that the Green Revolution is a story about how clever people thought it was a good idea to buy every extra unit of food through energy and chemicals. We do need a food revolution, but it's one that will require a radically new kind of science, a science that enables us to know less and redesign the world's crops for the world that we will be living in.
Right now, something like a billion people are living in conditions of water shortage. Yet our consumption of water just continues to increase. A staggering 70% of all available fresh water on Earth is being used for agriculture. And I want to focus on just one important aspect of increasing water use, hidden water. Hidden water is water used to produce things we consume that typically do not think of as containing water, such as chickens, beef, cotton, cars, chocolate, and even mobile phones. For example, it takes around three thousand litres of water to produce a burger. Over a hundred billion burgers are likely to be consumed this year globally. That's 300 trillion litres of water to produce burgers in one year. It takes around 9,000 litres of water to produce a chicken will probably consume 80 billion chickens this year. That's an astonishing 700 trillion litres of water on chickens in just one year. And it takes approximately 2,700 litres of water to produce a single bar of chocolate. This should surely be something to think about while you're curled up on your sofa, eating one in your pajamas. But I've got bad news about pajamas. <laughs> because your cotton pajamas take something like 9,000 litres of water to produce. An irony of ironies, it takes something like four litres of water to produce a one litre plastic bottle of water. In short, we're consuming water, like food, at a rate which is completely unsustainable. The term peak oil is an increasingly familiar one. It refers to the point at which maximum possible oil extraction is reached, beyond which it starts to decline and generally accepted claim is that we've reached peak oil and that we're heading for some global energy crisis in the next few decades as we start to run out. But it's almost certainly not true. There are enormous reserves of oil, coal and gas left. And every year we're discovering significant new reserves from Brazil to the Arctic. And on top of that, there's the so-called energy game-changing revolution that is fracking. So I'm not worried about us running out of fossil fuels. I'm worried that we're going to continue to use them, because doing so is simply going to accelerate our climate problem even further. But of course, that's precisely what we're doing. Take, for example, Exxon, the US oil giant. In 2012, Exxon signed a deal with Russia to invest up to $500 billion. $500 billion in oil and gas exploration and production in the Arctic. Why? Because climate change is now making 
oil and gas exploration production in the Arctic economically viable because the Arctic is no longer covered in thick ice all year round. It's worth reminding ourselves our stuff does not actually come from Tesco, Amazon, Walmart, or Best Buy. Our stuff comes from China, Morocco, Brazil, Spain, South Korea, whether it's asparagus, pajamas, or consumer electronics. Something like 500 million containers of our stuff, stuff that we love to consume, plus billions of tons of raw materials, metals, phosphates, grain, oil, coal, and gas, will be handled and transported all around the world this year. There are now over a billion motor vehicles on our roads and more than two billion motor vehicles have been produced since 1900. Now, car companies keep telling us that we can buy a car for as little as 8,000 pounds. But that's not what a car really costs. The iron ore forming the basis of the car's body has to be mined probably somewhere like Australia. It's then transported on a very large, very polluting ship to somewhere like Brazil, Indonesia, France, and made into steel. That steel is then transported on a very large, very polluting ship to a car factory in, say, Germany. The tires have to be manufactured, and the rubber will have been produced in Malaysia, Thailand, or Indonesia. That rubber then has to be shipped to a country that manufactures tires, and then those tires shipped to a car factory. The plastic for the dashboard starts out as oil in the ground. That oil has to be extracted and exported to be made into plastic. And then that plastic gets transported to a car factory to be turned into a dashboard. The lead in the battery has to be mined then shipped to be made into batteries, and then those batteries are then shipped to car factories in Germany, the US, or elsewhere. And all of this is before a single car is even assembled, let alone before the car itself is then transported so that you can buy it. And all that is before you've put a single litre of petrol in your car to make your own little contribution to climate change. What's the real cost of a car? An absolute fortune. But you don't have to pay it. Not yet. That is, the cost of environmental degradation, pollution from mining, industrial processes, and transportation, the resulting degradation of ecosystems, and climate change. What economists like to fondly call externalities. But this cost, the real cost of a car, will have to be paid for, maybe by you, more likely by your children. Finally, let's look at the state of the climate right now. In the last 30 years, the volume of summer Arctic sea ice 
has shrunk by 70%. Greenland and Antarctica are losing between 300 and 600 billion tons of ice per year into the sea. And to make matters worse, probably much worse, melting Arctic ice caused by our activities is now causing the release of significant quantities of methane. At the end of 2011, scientists from the International Arctic Research Centre discovered for the first time vast fields containing over 100 plumes of methane, some over a kilometre in diameter. Methane is many times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And if, as seems likely, melting sea ice is now causing the release of this methane, it will go on for decades, possibly centuries, and we'll be completely unable to stop it. It has every potential to accelerate climate change even faster. This could be very big trouble on a very big scale. Almost all of the data that are emerging from the Arctic are worse, far worse, than even the most pessimistic scientific predictions of even just 10 years ago. And think about this. Right now, every leaf on every tree on Earth is experiencing a level of carbon dioxide that has not been witnessed on this planet for millions of years. And how the planet's plants will respond to this, we simply don't fully understand. But it's very important, because the planet's plants are a fundamental component of what's called the global carbon cycle. The global carbon cycle processes around 200 gigatons of carbon every year. And it does all seven billion of us an enormous favor by slowing down climate change. Because the planets, plants, soils, and oceans absorb around 50% of our CO2 emissions. But this favour might be about to come to an end because we are fundamentally modifying every single component of the global carbon cycle right now through deforestation, urbanisation, agriculture and changes to the chemical and the ecological composition of the planet's oceans. Moreover, the CO2 that the oceans are absorbing is now having a serious impact in terms of ocean acidification and deoxygenation. The science now points to the inescapable fact that we are in trouble, serious trouble. And right now, we're heading into completely uncharted territory as we continue to grow towards 10 billion. But one thing that is entirely predictable is that things are going to get worse.
What kind of challenges do we face over the coming decades as a consequence of our growing population and our activities? We are already using nearly 40% of land on Earth for food. Yet demand for food is set to double by 2050. This means the pressure to clear many of the world's remaining forests for human use looks set to intensify. Why? Because this is the only land available for cheaply expanding agriculture at the scale that we need. By 2050, it's quite possible that some one billion hectares of land could be cleared to meet rising food demand. This is an area larger than the United States of America. Meanwhile, by 2050, 70% of us are going to be living in cities. It's just worth mentioning that of the 19 Brazilian cities that have doubled in population and size in the last 10 years, 10 are in the Amazon. It is becoming apparent that there is no known way of feeding a population of 10 billion people with our current agricultural system and our current rates of consumption. Because global agricultural productivity actually looks set to decline, possibly sharply, over the coming decades. There are three reasons for this. The first is climate change. As global average temperature continues to increase, food productivity is actually predicted to decline. Some of the world's most important crops, such as wheat, could be worse affected. An increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather events associated with climate change will increase the frequency and severity with which we lose crops around the world. The second reason is soil degradation and desertification, both of which are increasing as a result of water runoff, pollution, intensified agricultural practices, and overgrazing. And the third reason is water stress from more frequent and severe droughts and the rising consumption of water by billions more people. If we want to get just a glimpse of what we can expect over the decades to come, we need only look at the impact of heat waves in Australia in 2008, Russia in 2010, and the United States in 2012, which destroyed up to 40% of grain and corn harvests and killed tens of thousands of livestock. In the heat wave of 2010, Russian government was forced to place an embargo on grain exports. And this caused chaos in the commodities markets and a massive food price spike. This consequently led to food riots across Asia and Africa. Unrest that eventually led to the violence that we now call the Arab Spring.
Indeed, anyone who thinks that the emerging state of global affairs does not have potential for civil and international conflict is deluding themselves. It's no coincidence that almost every scientific conference I go to about climate change now has a new kind of attendee, the military. By the end of this century, large parts of this planet will not have anything like enough usable water. Billions of people are likely to be living in conditions of extreme water shortage as a result of increasing climate change, increasing food demand, and increasing population. Our use of groundwater, which is essential for irrigation, is accelerating rapidly far faster than groundwater is or can be replenished. And freshwater supplies stored in the planet's glaciers and snow cover are projected to decline alarmingly this century, severely affecting up to one-sixth of the entire human population in countries such as China, Pakistan and India. Our water problem is unavoidably going to have very adverse consequences for agriculture, human health, and ecosystems. You might not be surprised to learn that air traffic, global car production, and shipping are all expected to continue to grow this century. Well, for starters, we look set to produce another 4 billion cars in just the next 50 years. And global shipping and air traffic are projected to expand to transport more of our stuff and more of us around the planet. That's going to cause yet more problems in terms of CO2 emissions, more black carbon, and more pollution. Our emerging energy problem is also simple. We are going to need to triple energy production by the end of this century to meet expected demand. To meet that demand, we would need to build, roughly speaking, 1,800 of the world's largest dams, or 23,000 nuclear power stations, 14 million wind turbines, or 36 billion solar panels. Or we could just keep going with predominantly oil, coal, and gas, and build something like the 36,000 new power stations that we will need. Our existing fossil fuel reserves are worth trillions of dollars. Our governments and the world's major energy companies, some of the most influential corporations on Earth, really going to decide to leave all of that money in the ground as demand for energy continues to grow and grow. I really doubt it. And so on to our emerging climate problem. And this problem is on an entirely different scale. Because the problem is that we may well be heading towards a number of tipping points in the global climate system. All complex systems are characterized by one important feature. A very small change 
can lead to a very large effect that can tip the system into an entirely different and entirely unpredictable state. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has said that we need to aim to limit global average temperature rises to two degrees or less. The rationale for this target is that a rise of above two degrees risks catastrophic climate change that would almost certainly lead to irreversible planetary tipping points caused by events such as the melting of the Arctic and Antarctic ice, the release of methane from the Arctic and Siberian permafrost, or dieback of the Amazon. But the fact is, loss of ice from the Arctic and Antarctic and the release of methane is already happening now, at well below the two degree threshold. And as for the dieback of the Amazon, we're not even waiting for climate change to do this. We're doing it right now through deforestation. And recent research shows that we actually look to be heading for a larger rise in global average temperature than two degrees, a far larger rise. It looks as though we're heading for a global average temperature rise of four degrees. And we can't even rule out a rise of six degrees. A four to six degree rise in global average temperature will be absolutely catastrophic. It will lead to runaway climate change capable of tipping the planet into an entirely different state rapidly. In the decades along the way, we will witness unprecedented extremes of fires, floods, heat waves, loss of crops, water stress, and sea level rises. There almost certainly won't be a country called Bangladesh by the end of this century. It will be underwater. And the Amazon could be turned into savanna or even desert. And the entire agricultural system will be faced with an unprecedented threat. More fortunate countries, such as the UK, United States, most of Europe, may even look something approaching like militarized countries, at least in terms of border controls, to prevent millions of people from entering who are on the move because their own country is either no longer habitable or has insufficient food or water or is experiencing conflict over increasingly scarce resources. These people will be climate migrants, a term I think we're going to have to get used to. Even more worryingly, there is now compelling evidence that the entire global ecosystem is not only capable of suffering a catastrophic tipping point, but it's already approaching such 
a transition. We are the drivers of every global problem we face. Climate change, ecosystem degradation, mass extinctions, alteration of the planet's global carbon cycle, increasing demand for food, water, energy, and other resources. Highly interconnected problems, each one contributing to the other. And as the human population continues to increase, every one of these problems is set to grow. Yet, we are failing to do much, if anything, about them. What then are our options? The first is technologize our way out of it. And this is the domain of what's known as the rational optimist. And the rational optimist argument says that past predictions of doom, such as those of Malthus and Ehrlich, have turned out to be wrong, not least because our cleverness and our inventiveness have enabled us to solve the population problem on every occasion. And the great example they show is the Green Revolution. Now, setting aside the fact that we've technologized our way into these problems in the first place, let's look at the current ideas for technologizing our way out of them. First is green energy. Wind, wave, solar, hydro, biofuels, or sometimes called renewables. The fact is that green energy technologies are currently highly unlikely to be a viable planetary solution on the scale required or in the time required. Even if existing green technologies were a global solution, we would need to be embarking on a planetary-wide green energy program right now, and we're not. Even if we had embarked on such a program, it would be decades before we could power the planet with green energy. And in the meantime, almost all of our energy will continue to come from fossil fuels from oil, coal and gas, continuing to contribute to our climate problem every year. I never thought I'd say this, but in the short term, nuclear power would seem to be the only existing technology for solving the energy problem. But for nuclear power to be a solution, we would need to be embarking on a global nuclear power program right now. And we're not. Governments the world over are retreating from nuclear power because it's expensive, because neither government nor industry wants to pick up the cost of decommissioning, and because voters do not like it. Next, we could potentially solve some of our water problem through the building of desalination plants, which convert seawater into usable water. But again, such programs are not even on the horizon. Next, geoengineering. This is essentially the notion 
that planetary scale engineering efforts might be needed simply to mitigate the worst consequences of the problems that we're going to face. For example, putting massive umbrellas into orbit around our planet to reflect the sun's energy back out into space. And I'll leave it to you to make of that as you wish. The problem is all of the current geoengineering ideas are completely unproven. All of them are extremely expensive, and all of them are likely to come with significant knock-on effects, the long-term consequences of which are completely unpredictable. So as far as I'm concerned, on current evidence, technologizing our way out of this does not look likely. So let's look at our second option, behavior change. We're going to need to change our behavior radically and globally on every level. But to accomplish this will almost certainly require radical government action. But here, politicians are currently part of the problem because the decisions needed to be taken to implement the kind of behavior change needed will inevitably make politicians remarkably unpopular. And politicians do like to be popular. So what politicians have opted for instead is failed diplomacy. For example, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, whose job it's been for 20 years to ensure the stabilization of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Failed. The UN Convention to Combat Desertification, whose job it's been for 20 years to stop land degrading and becoming desert. Failed. The Convention on Biological Diversity, whose job it's been for 20 years to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. Failed. These are just three examples of failed global initiatives. In Rio Plus 20, COP18 in Doha and COP19 in Warsaw all produced even weaker rhetoric than previous pledges, conventions and commitments. The world is expecting us to reach some kind of agreement concerning climate change and not just continuing discussing procedure, procedure, procedure. It looks like 20 years of words and inaction is set to continue with another 20 years of words and inaction. And all the while, we're heading into deeper and deeper trouble. And the way governments justify this degree of inaction is by exploiting public opinion and scientific uncertainty. It used to be the case of, we need to wait for science to prove that climate change is happening. And that is now beyond doubt. So now it's that we need to wait for scientists to be able to tell us what the impact will be and what the costs are. And then we will need to wait for public opinion to get behind action. But climate models are never going to be free from uncertainties. And as for public opinion, politicians seem remarkably free to ignore it when it suits them. What about us? How can we change our behavior? I confess, I did once find it quite amusing to read in the weekend papers about some celebrity saying, I've given up my four by four and now I've bought a hybrid. Aren't I doing my bit for the environment? They're not doing their bit for the environment. But in many respects, it's not their fault. The fact is that they and we are not being well informed. We're simply not getting the information that we need. And when we are advised to do something, it's a token gesture that missed the fundamental fact 
that the scale and the nature of the problems we face are immense, unprecedented, and possibly unsolvable. The behavior changes that are required are so fundamental that no one wants to make them. And what are they? Well, consume less, but a lot less. Less food, less energy, less stuff. Fewer cars, electric cars, cotton t-shirts, laptops, TVs. Far fewer. And the interesting thing is, we know this. Yet every decade, global consumption just continues to increase. And it is worth pointing out here that we simply refers to the people who live in the west and the north of the planet predominantly. There are currently almost three billion people who need to urgently consume more. More water, more food, more energy. And by the end of this century, there will be billions more who need to consume more water, food and energy. So what about population growth itself? Even saying don't have children is utterly ridiculous. That said, the worst thing that we can continue to do globally is continue to have children at our current rate. Because if we do so, according to UN predictions, by the end of this century, there will not be 10 billion of us there will be 28 billion of us. Only an idiot would deny that there's a carrying capacity to Earth. And the question is, is it 7 billion, 10 billion, or 28 billion? I think we've already gone past it, well past it. We could potentially change the situation we are in. Probably not by technologizing our way out of it, but by radically changing our behavior. But there is no sign that this is happening or that it's about to happen. So I think it's going to be business as usual for us. As a scientist, what do I think about the current situation? Well, science is essentially organized skepticism. I spend my life trying to prove my work, wrong or look for alternative explanations. I hope I'm wrong. But the science points to my not being wrong. As I said at the beginning, we can rightly call the situation we're all in an emergency an unprecedented planetary emergency. And why we're not doing more given the scale and the urgency of the problem, I simply cannot understand. We urgently need to do 
And I mean do something radical to avert a global catastrophe. But I don't think we will. I think we're fucked. If we discovered tomorrow that there was an asteroid on collision course with Earth, we were able to calculate that it was going to hit Earth on the 3rd of June, 2080. And we knew that its impact was going to wipe out 70% of all life on Earth. Governments worldwide would marshal the entire planet into unprecedented action. Every scientist, engineer, university and business would be enlisted to find a way of stopping it. We are now in almost precisely that situation. Except that there isn't a date and there isn't an asteroid. The problem is us.